Don't grow weary of the watering process. Amen? All right. In Romans 4, just kind of setting up what we're going to be talking about uh, tonight, and uh, he's talking about being fully persuaded. He's talking about the word of confidence. If, we're, if our words released out of our mouth is going to have the same power that Jesus had when he spoke the word, which it's supposed to, amen, amen, uh, then there are things that we must be fully persuaded about. Amen. Amen. So it's not just spouting off a bunch of words, but we must be fully persuaded in our hearts. Amen. It's a heart and mouth connection, isn't it? It's the heart and the mouth connection. And so let's read what, uh, what Paul says here in Romans, probably a familiar scripture to faith people. Romans 4, 17, it says, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Of course, uh, talking about Abraham here, before him whom he believed, even God who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. So God calls things that be not as though they were. Is that right? Are we called to do the very same thing? So this isn't saying that we call those things um, that don't exist as though they existed. It says we call those things that be not. So they exist in the spirit realm. Amen. They exist in the spirit realm. So our job is to call them into the physical realm. Amen. So we call those things that be not as though they were. We call for what we want. According to God's word. We call for what we want according to God's word. Charles Capps put it this way. When, when you stand out on the porch and you're wanting the dog, quit calling the cat. Amen. Pay attention to what your mouth is calling for. Amen. All right. Verse 18, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken that's right so shall thy seed be so abraham had a word from the lord did he not he had a god told him i have made you the father of many nations and this is when he did not have one single solitary uh seed of his own is that right all right so uh, a word from god is necessary for faith we can't get faith any other way we can't get faith any other way than from a word from God. Amen. Verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. All right. Now, come on. If we're not going to be weak in faith, there's some things we're going to have to not consider. Going to say it again. If we're not going to be weak in faith, then there are some things that we are not going to have to give our attention to. And how many of you know we live in a very physical world and there's very physical things, things we see with our eyes, things we feel with our body, amen, things that our bank account says to us. Amen. And if we are going to be strong in faith, then, then those are the things we are not going to, that we're going to need to not consider, give our attention to. There's, there's no way around this. You will never be a person of great faith if you're led by your eyes and by your ears. Amen. Amen. So to be of great faith, we need one thing, and that's a word from God. Is that right? So it's up to us. Listen. It's up to us what we give our attention to. It's up to us what we give our attention to. And I'm just going to say this. When we get up in the mornings, our first thought should be, I'm talking to myself. I'm not doing this. I'm doing this. You understand? Just as if I was standing in front of a mirror. My first thought must be to spend time with him and in his word. The last thing we need to be doing is getting up as, as a child of God and turning news on. We don't start our day that way. We'll never be people of great faith 
if that's what is before our eye gates and our ear gates. Amen. God has tremendous promises for us in his word. And it's going to take effort. It's not works. It's not works, but it's our partnership with the Lord. It's our will being surrendered to him. Amen. So it's going to take effort on our part to give our attention to what God says in his word. Amen. I talk to myself like this all the time, you guys. I, I, I mean, I really do. How many of you have gotten up and you didn't even feel saved before? You know, I felt like that. I mean, feelings are a booger, you know. Feelings are a booger sometimes. And I've had to look myself in the mirror and say, Mona, you don't live by feelings. You walk and you live by faith. What does God say about this? And I got and I talk to myself. Amen. Amen. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Amen. Oh, he staggered not at the promise of God. This, this passage right here is one of the first passages that I wrote in my Bible. I, I think I was 18 years old. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. If we're going to be strong in faith, then just like Pastor taught on Sunday, we're going to be a people of praise. We are going to be a people of praise, giving glory to God. Amen? Amen. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. You know, uh, you remember the, the man that said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Do you remember that? So we can, be, we can be persuaded and have faith in our heart regarding what God said. Yes, God, I see this in your word. I do, Lord. I believe that. I believe that. Where unbelief comes in, and, and they can be operating at the same time. Unbelief comes in at just the things we see with our eyes, that we hear. Is, is that right? That, that's, where, that's where unbelief comes in. And we're not going to be um, um, uh, how to say this. We're in a natural world. And we're not going to be out of this natural world until we step over into eternity. Amen. Amen. So, so we, we, have to, uh, we have to learn how to, again, um, oh, sorry, Brad. He told me to stay put. Um, we, we, have, we have to learn and be disciplined, again, at what we see and what we hear. And we always go back to what does the Word say? What does God say about that? I mean, the, the Bible is full of promises of good news. Amen. Amen. Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. Amen. If we believe that, if we believe John 10, our nose would be in this book way more than what it is. Amen. Come on. Amen. Staggered not, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded, say fully persuaded, that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Woo, that's just good news right there. There is a place called fully persuaded. There is a place called fully persuaded. Amen. Don't be content with not being there. Amen. And, and we're, none of us are fully persuaded about every promise in this book. None of us are. Okay? But I'm saying don't be content with not being fully persuaded. Amen. All the promises of God are yes and amen. Yes and amen. They're yes and amen to me. They're yes and amen to my family. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd. We shall not want. There's no want. There's no lack. Amen. Don't be content with not being fully persuaded. You say, well, how do I become fully persuaded? Right here. That right here. This is it. Ain't nobody going to be able to, uh, 
be fully persuaded for you. That was not good English. Don't, don't send me a text and, or anything. But that's the truth. Amen. God is good. God is good. God is good. All the time, the whole reason the Son of God was made manifest was to undo the works of the devil. He delivered us from the kingdom of darkness. He translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. He's given us great and precious promises for our life here and now. Amen. And, and we don't, it, it's not even our faith. He's given us his word that produces the faith. We don't even have to produce it. God is good. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to get into the message tonight. In Luke, the fourth chapter, we see references to Jesus and the things, uh, one of the main things that was remarkable about him and his ministry. Verse uh, 22, when he had begun to speak, Luke 4, 22, they all bear him witness and uh, wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? If you skip down to verse 32, 32, it says they were astonished at his doctrine. We'd say at his teaching for his word was with power. Everybody said out loud, his word, his word. Was, with power. was with power. His, notice, um, it didn't say they were intrigued by it. <laughs> they were noticed, they noticed it. They were what? Astonished. Astonished at how he spoke. And, and what was it about his words that astonished them? The power of his words. The power of his words. We see uh, later in this same text uh, the very next verse that there was a man in the synagogue that had an unclean spirit and verse 35 Jesus commanded and said hold your peace and come out of him. Now I want you to notice there is no negotiation. <laughs> no discussion. <laughs> right? This is not a request. <laughs> Come on, are y'all with me? Uh, and uh, it said that that's what happened. In verse 36, he came out. And verse 36, they were all what? Amazed. This is some of the same thing as astonished. And they spoke among themselves. And they said, what'd they say? What a word this is. Uh, uh, for with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. His word was with power. And that's what we're talking about in this series. And, and here they said his word was with authority and power. And these are two different words. And it's, it's actually a little bit um, of a challenge with the King James because they, they mix, the translators mixed them up sometimes. And so you really not kind of do a little bit of study to see, because there's a word for uh, exousia is the word for authority, and dunamis is the word for power, and they're not the same word. Um, it's like um, a police officer, for instance. Uh, the uniform, the badge is, and they're you know being authorized by whatever branch they serve. That's the exousia. That's authority. But the, uh, the pistol and the 200 pounds is dunamis. If you don't have some dunamis, the exousia won't be respected. If you don't have some power, then the authority uh, won't be respected. And um, it's, that's the world we live in because there are outlaws. There are those who don't care about what's right. And, and so you got to have some, some power 
to back up the authority. Well, Jesus spoke with both authority and power. Now, notice with me, if you would, um, over in um, Mark, the first chapter, the 22nd verse, they'll put it on the screen for us. Mark 122, it says a similar thing here. It says they were astonished at his doctrine. And then it gives you a little more insight. For he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. This is one of the reasons why it surprised them so much. They had heard a lot of um, people speaking in the synagogue with the scribes. They were uh, called the doctors of the law. And it'd be the equivalent of our doctors of divinity today. They spent their entire uh, adult life studying the law and the prophets and those things. And they were the experts on the law. And then you had the priests and you had the uh, uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees and all of those guys. And so they had heard what we would call teaching, speaking in the synagogue. But not like this. Not like this. So what was the difference? He taught them, look at it again in, in Mark 1.22. He taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Uh, let's see, look with me. In, you're, you're there in Mark. Go to the 11th chapter of Mark. Now, m- many of us are familiar with Mark 11, 22, 23, 24. These great faith verses that uh, Jesus spoke. But I want you to notice what it flows into. Go to the 22nd verse and uh, Mark eleven twenty two. 22. What had happened in this setting is that Jesus, uh, I guess some 24 hours previously, they walked by a fig tree and he spoke to the tree. And again, it was not a negotiation. It was not a request. He just spoke over it. No one eat fruit of you hereafter forever. And that's one of the things that, that caught them so by surprise is how confidently and boldly he spoke with authority and power. And so some 24 hours later, they came by and saw the fig tree already dried up from the roots, the scripture said. And Peter remarked, look, Lord, the the fig tree's already dried up. And he used that as an opportunity to teach them about faith. He said in verse 22, have faith in God. Or the margin says, have the faith of God. Some say, have the God kind of faith. He's talking about operating in faith like God does, like he did. And he's telling them they can do it. If you read Matthew 21, the next verse here in verse 23, he talks about speaking to the mountain. But in Matthew 21, that's Matthew's account of the same happening. He says, if you have faith and doubt not, you'll not only do that which is done to the fig tree, but if you say to this mountain, it'll obey you. So is he telling them they could do what he just did? Yes. He is. And that's what much of the church has missed. They, uh, Jesus' person, his sinless, spotless being is in a class by itself. Nobody could be our perfect sacrifice except him. Amen. But his ministry should not be put in a class by itself. The things he did, the way he prayed, the way he preached and taught, even ministering healing and working miracles was an example for the rest of us to follow. 
So you need to distinguish between what he did as our sacrifice and our substitute from what he did as our example. Much of the church has put everything that he did in a category unattainable to us. And that has robbed the church. No, he told them they could do what he did. And he had it recorded for all of us to still be talking about it in 2021. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hmm? And didn't he say in John 14, if you believe on me, the works I do, you'll do also. And greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. And he went on to say, if you will ask, or actually that word is also translated require or demand anything in my name, I will do it. Oh, come on. Did you hear that? Jesus said, if you'll require anything in my name, I'll do it. That's how we'll be able to do the kind of things he did because he's backing us up. He's backing us up when we do what he tells us to do. Now, uh, keep reading in verse 23 here. Jesus said, verily I say to you that whoever, so this will work for whoever, will say to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. This is an amazing, wonderful word from the master. Two big things he said you have to do to get the results that he has got. One, you got to say something. And much of the church is still missing it on that. They won't say anything on purpose in faith. Secondly, you got to believe what you say and not doubt. Now the word doubt here is the same word that over in James and other places is translated waver. Waver. So if you will say and not waver in your heart, but believe that what you said will come to pass, you'll have what you say. He didn't just say you'll have what you say. He said, if you'll say it, and what else? Not doubt. We haven't, we've we've rushed too too quickly over that one. Because you hear people saying, well, I, you know, I said it and it didn't work. Well, the first place to look would be right here. Did you waver on it? And that has been the case again and again and again. People said things. But they weren't really convinced of it. They were trying it. They were trying to convince themselves while they're saying it. But you've got to be convinced. Come on, are y'all with me? And that is where there's been failure after failure. Let's read it again. Jesus said, if you'll say, and what? Not doubt. In your heart, but believe that what you said comes to pass, you'll have what you said. And you'll find that a powerful word is a bold word. A powerful word is a confident word. A fully persuaded word. That's why if you're not sure if it's God's will for you to be healed or not, you can't speak a word of power over your body because you're wavering. Yes, sir. If you're not sure if it's God's will for your bills to be paid and for you to even have some nice things, you can't speak a word of power over anything. You're going to be wavering. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. We hope so. And how much of the church is there? Maybe we hope so. Or much of the church thinks, they imagine, we're leaving it up to God. It's up to Him. And so we don't really know what will happen. We'll just have to wait and see. Whatever is His will. No, He's revealed His will. 
And he's told us we have a part to play in it. Amen. But we must get settled. Amen. We must become convinced. Yes. Yes. We must become convinced. Uh, keep, keep reading here. Verse uh, 25 or 24, what, what things have you desire when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. That same confidence is here. You've got to believe you're praying something according to the will of God. You've got to believe he heard you. You've got to believe it's granted to you. Come, come in, you see the boldness, the confidence. And boldness is not something you just work up. Boldness is not something you conjure up, you work up. You're bold because you're sure. Come on, y'all with me, church. You're bold. Sit out loud. You're bold because you're sure. What if you're not sure? You're not bold and your words will be powerless. Your words will be powerless. You have to be convinced. You have to be persuaded. And that's why we keep talking about, you know, hearing the word. We keep talking about faith school. Why would I need to hear something after I've heard it one time? <laughs> or why would I need to hear something 50 times before it would start working out of my mouth? Because it took you that long to get persuaded. It didn't take God a long time. He hadn't changed. He's not going to change. But a lot of times, that's the answer to a lot of people's question. Well, why is it taking so long? Because it's taking you a long time to get really persuaded. Not convinced yet. Not sure yet. And so part of the problem is listen to the right thing part of the time. Listen to the wrong thing part of the time. Hmm? Listen to a mixture in a bag of things and you're confused. But, and you see that right here, the distinguishing between how Jesus taught and preached and how the uh, doctors of the law did. Keep, keep reading. He said, verse 25, and when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father which is in heaven may forgive you. Um, why, why would that be a factor? Again, it has to do with confidence. If my heart is bothering me because of, again, we talked about that in the offering, about issues with other people, that's going to undermine my confidence. So I, I've got to be confident and I must not be condemned. Can you see these two big things? For my words to have power. And what, so what does the enemy work in against us all the time? To get us guessing, right? Can you see that? And get us condemned. To get us guessing and wondering and unsure and to get us condemned because of our own failures and mistakes. Because he knows if he can keep you questioning and he can keep you condemned, your words will have no power. They'll be empty Idle words, vain words. But Jesus was convinced. He knew what he had heard from the Father. Amen. And he, he wasn't yielding and giving place to the enemy, so he had no condemnation. He had no confusion and no condemnation. And his words were powerful. When he spoke, he'd about knock you off the chair. <laughs> well, why, would, why were they astonished? They were like, whoa, did you, did you hear that? Why? Well, skip on down to, uh, let's see, uh, verse 32 or so. If we had time, we'd go through every one of these verses because it, it builds up to it. Uh, there was a question. Uh, well, back up to verse 31. Let me see. Uh, 30. Jesus asked them, uh, well, I hadn't gone back far enough. 28? Let's try 28. 
Uh, they said to him, by what authority do you do these things? Uh, and, and they had a problem with Jesus' boldness. Because, I mean, uh, if they wanted to get mouthy in public, he was bold. Hmm. <laughs> he would say, you vipers, who warned you to escape hell? He said, you hypocrites. And he's not trying to be mean. It, it, it's just the truth. And they are not listening to the truth. They need something to jar them a little bit. And then he had gone in there and, and, and turned over the money changers tables and ran them out. Oh man, they had a problem with that. But can, can I, now you're messing with their money. <laughs> and so they, they call him on the carpet, so to speak, in front of other people. And they go, by what authority? Are you doing these things? Remember, that's one of the things that people were astonished about because he spoke with authority and power. And by what authority do you do these things? And who gave you this authority? Because see, they think they're the authority. And he didn't come to them and ask permission. And uh, who gave you this authority to do these things? Keep going. Jesus answered him and said, well, I will ask you a question and answer me. You know, we need to learn this in dealing with the enemy. You don't have to answer all questions. You don't. He said, well, I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> and you answer me and then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. And they were like, no, no, no. You have to answer us. He's like, no, I don't. How about this? The baptism of John. Keep going. Was it from heaven or men? Answer me. <laughs> oh, man. And when he, you got to remember, they're doing this in front of the crowd. And when he said that, you know, the whole crowd looked at him and like, Yeah. <laughs> You, you could have felt, they felt it. Right. They felt the tide has turned. Oh, because see, they, they thought they're going to get Jesus in trouble. They're going to make a big deal out of this. And so verse 31, they reasoned with themselves. And this is the problem. They are their own authority. So they consulted with themselves. And in doing that, you will never be confident. Amen. You're your own authority. You, you hear Christians say, well, I got a right to my beliefs. Not if you're a Christian. Right. If you're a Christian, you're supposed to believe the Bible. Yes. You're supposed to believe what the Lord told you. Yes. Not just make up things as you go along. Now, if you're not a believer, of course, you can believe anything you want to. Right. Doesn't make it right. You can believe lies. You can be deceived. But they reasoned with themselves. And, and, and instead of really trying to see the answer from God, did God really send John? I mean, you'd have to show some humility and some honesty to deal with this properly. And you can see their hearts are not right because that was not their, their big concern was public opinion. Not truth. If we say from heaven, he'll say, well, why didn't you believe him then? Why didn't you go with it? Keep going. And if we say of men, they feared the people because all men counted John that he was really a prophet. Indeed. Keep going. And they answered and said to Jesus, we can't tell. And this was after careful consideration. <laughs> we cannot tell. And Jesus answered and said to them, neither do I tell you. <laughs> By what authority? He didn't say he couldn't. He said, well, then I'm not telling you either. <laughs> By what authority? This did not go as they had planned right. yeah. or hoped. <laughs> Why am I talking about this? 
This is all in connection. Just a few verses earlier is when Jesus taught them about speaking and not doubting in their heart and not wavering. And why are we talking about he, he spoke uh, with authority and power, not like the scribes. How did the scribes speak? We, we're not sure. We can't tell. And this is how intellectualism talks. I know some years ago, a friend of mine that I knew back in high school wound up going to seminary. And uh, it was shocking to both of us because we had no intention of being ministers when we were in high school. We were actually a bit rowdy. And <laughs> we like fast cars and, you know, all kind of stuff. And, and so um, he winds up in seminary working on his doctorate of theology. And I was uh, over at Rama, involved in healing school and, and, and also uh, later allowed to teach some things in, in the Bible school. And so I didn't have a doctorate in theology, and so I knew he was getting some things that I wasn't getting. So we, we had a little conversation one day. We didn't spend much time together, but, but I, I was interested. I said, tell me, what, man, what, what are you learning? What's, what's going on? And he told me about, you know, in, in the study of these things, you have all these ologies. Eschatology, you know, this ology, that ology. And, uh, and so he was talking about one of these areas, and he said, he studied such as, I said, okay, what, what have you got? What have you found out? He said, well, uh, Dr. So-and-so has this position of, of this about this. And he says, but other Dr. So-and-so has another position. And he described it in detail. He said, but also other Dr. So-and-so. And he described four different positions about it. And uh, I said, uh, Okay, uh, what do you believe? He said, well, I see some merit in first doctor so-and-so's position, but I also see merit in a second doctor. So, and there's a doctor three has a point and doctor four. And, and so I, while he's talking, I realize he's not settled about any of this. And so if he has to use his faith in this area in real life, He's not ready. Because all of these conflicting views cannot be right. Now, there are people who say, well, no, you, we need to be widely read and appreciate all these different opinions, not if you believe the Bible. If you believe that the Bible is the inspired living word of God, then you believe it's right. And if something contradicts it, it can't be right. That can't be right also. Now, this is one of the big things that distinguishes us from other people. And they will call us ignorant. They'll call us narrow-minded that we're not embracing the larger uh, theological world and appreciating other people's religions and, and, and all of their beliefs. And they're saying you should be more accommodating. You, you should be more receptive, not according to the Bible. Amen. Phyllis and I were talking about this early, that people were saying something that, you know, they didn't agree with a certain belief that some of us had. And, that, and the, per, the minister said, well, I, I don't get to choose what I believe. I have a book. It tells me what to believe. And I can't change it. And I don't want to. And that's what you want to do. Don't let people pull you into a you versus them situation. You say, no, no, no. I don't make up my own beliefs. I have a book. Oh, somebody say, I have a book. I, I, I have a book. And it tells me what to believe. And whether I think so or not, if I'm going to submit to the Lordship of Jesus, I submit to this word. And I say, that's right. It's always been right. It always will be right. Society will change. All kind of opinions will vary. Fads will come and go. But Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. But my word will never pass away. I believe that. Amen. I said, I believe that. I believe Church, you believe that? Amen. Somebody say, I have a book. I have a, I have I have a book. book. 
It tells me what to believe. And see, the thing is, the more convinced of his word I am, he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you will and it'll be done for you. That means your prayer had power and your words will have power. Why? When you become absolutely convinced fully persuaded of something from God and then you say that with authority over your life, power will accompany your words. Things will change. But we got to get past this wavering, wondering, questioning, casual, lazy attitude about, well, whatever. Everybody has their beliefs. I don't know. You may be right. I might be right. We'll have to wait and see. Well, you will have a powerless life. Powerless. Powerless prayers. Powerless words. We don't want that. We want to walk in the footsteps of the master. Is that right? Speaking like he spoke. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody say, speaking, speaking. Like, he spoke. like he spoke. In 2 uh, in Timothy 1.7, put that on the screen for us, if you would. 2 Timothy 1.7. It said, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. Everybody say power. 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 Love and a sound mind. The, uh, the Amplified, put that up if you can. Amplified, God did not give us a spirit of timidity. That's a, if you look up the word, that's a good word for, for that one here. Timidity. And he go, the Amplified goes on to say of cowardice, craven, cringing, fawning fear. But he's given us a spirit of power and of love and of calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. Why, why do I say this? Because timidness is not good. Timidness is just a lesser degree of fear. It's the same bad stuff, whether you're just a little apprehensive or whether you're in full blown panic, it's the same stuff, just varying degrees of it. And God does not want us to have any fear. In our lives. But approaching things, your prayer, your confessions with hesitation shows it's not going to happen. Well, let's, uh, you you know, I I think maybe this would be a good thing. Let's pray and see what happens. You're not ready to pray. Are y'all with me? Yes. Well, I'll, I'll just say this and see, you know, I, I think it goes like you're not ready to say until you get persuaded. Amen. What did Mark eleven twenty three 23 say? What did Jesus say? If you'll say, and what? Not waver, not doubt, not waver in your heart. This is a heart thing, not a head thing. Faith is not of the intellect. Faith is a, you you believe with your heart. It's the same place you love with. Hmm? Love is not intellectual. You don't go, okay, I weigh in this and weigh in this. Yeah, a lot of, I need more information to see if I love them or not. (laughs) Maybe if I had different information, I would love them. But now here's some new information. I don't love them. Love is not of the head. I mean, most everybody knows that. Love's of the heart. All right? And faith is not of the head. Faith is of the heart. And uh, when you're persuaded of something, you, you may not be able to fully express to people why you are. I mean, you, you can share a verse, but that doesn't mean they'll see it. I'm persuaded that God is real and good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Jesus is his son and the only Savior. The only way to God, 
to salvation, to heaven. I'm, I'm persuaded of that. I'm not analyzing it. I want to understand more about it, but I'm not, the, the jury is not out. Do you know what I mean by that? I, I'm not gathering information to get to the point of decision. I, I, I've made my decision. I believe it. I said, I believe it. I, I, I'm, I'm convinced there's an enemy. There's a thief that's trying to steal, kill, and destroy against me, against you, every day of our life. But I'm convinced that he's been defeated. Amen. And I'm convinced that we've been given the armor of God. Amen. Hallelujah. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word, the word of power, the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that we've been given that name and I have authority to speak in that name. Amen. And so when the works of the enemy try to steal from me or hurt me, I can be bold. Yes. Oh, somebody say bold, bold, bold. Not hesitant, not timid, bold. Bold to speak right up and say, stop it in Jesus' name. I command you, stop in your operations, cease from your maneuvers. Now, what is a key to my words having power? I am fully persuaded. I am not wavering about this. I'm not wondering if I have authority in that name, if I have the right to use that name. Come on, can you see? I'm, I'm not confused about it, and I'm not condemned. I'm convinced and I'm bold. That's when your words will carry impact. When you're no longer trepidatious, you're no longer timid, no longer hesitant, no longer wavering. So, and if you say, well, okay, I, I've been wavering. What, you know, pray for me that I'll quit. I don't need to pray for you. You need to get your nose in the book. You, you need to listen to what God said and keep listening to it and make up your mind that it's true and get it settled and quit considering alternative ideas. Hallelujah. Yes. Stop considering alternative beliefs. Get settled. Oh, when you get settled, it's when you get powerful. Amen. Oh, when you get settled... It's when you start praying prayers that heaven can back. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Woo! When you get settled, yes. it's when you start making bold confessions that the Spirit of God Amen. can manifest. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, somebody say hallelujah. 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 I'm going to preach myself happy. Oh, somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Go to... Uh, Acts, the fourth chapter, please. Jesus spoke boldly. He spoke confidently. He spoke with authority. He spoke with power. And when he did, miracles happened. Evil spirits left. Diseases left. Um... Even things in nature were changed. Even the dead were raised. And he had no confusion when he spoke. And he had no condemnation. I believe this is from the Spirit of God. Church, are y'all with me? Yes. Sit out loud. No confusion. No, confusion. no condemnation. No condemnation. We, we have to be in that place if we're not doubting, if we're not wavering. And then you speak and there's power in it. Then you pray and there's power in it. You'll see the connection between a holy boldness and miracles. You'll see that in, uh, in the book of Acts. You'll see it in Jesus' ministry. You'll see it in the book of Acts. Everybody say boldness, boldness. and miracles. In Acts 4, look with me here, please. Acts 4 and 13, Peter and John 
had just come by the, the gate at the temple and spoke to the man who was lame. And uh, remember what Peter said? He said, uh, what I have, I'm giving you in the name of Jesus, get up. Not a negotiation. Not a discussion. Not a question. Is he sure about something? He's bold. And so then it says, when they saw the what? Boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were unlearned and ignorant men. That means they they were uneducated. They they had no degrees in theology. (laughs) No doctorate of divinity. And yet, how could they be so bold? What did he say? They marveled. Well, that sounds like they were astonished, right? right? And they took knowledge of them that what? What? What what in their mind did they link together? When they saw them so boldly and, and, and definitely speaking their word, Peter's word was with authority. And power and the, even the people that didn't go along with it and believe in it, they immediately made the connection. That sounds like that other fella we tried to get rid of. Is that right? That sounds like that Jesus guy. That's right. <laughs> and why? They took knowledge of them that they had what? Somebody say they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. How do I get from confused and condemned uh, to confident and bold and sure. Hang out with Jesus. Amen. I said, hang out. Hallelujah. Hang out with Jesus. Yes, sir. Listen to him. Yes. Let him talk to you. Yes. Let him show you things. Hallelujah. Fellowship with him. Hang out in his presence. Amen. Next thing you know, you'll become convinced. That you are absolutely clean and washed by the blood of the Lamb and made righteous and have not one reason to be ashamed. You'll get rid of your condemnation. Hang out with Jesus. Hang out with him. Listen to what he's saying to you. You'll become absolutely convinced that you've been authorized over every evil spirit, over every sickness and disease in his amazing name. You'll become convinced. You'll become persuaded. And you'll start acting like him. You'll start acting like they did. They started acting like him. Now keep reading. Um, You know, the religious authorities, they did not like this. They did not accept this. And see, you see why? They thought they are the authority. And even when it came to a question that Jesus asked them about something significant as far as God's plan and, and kingdom things, they just reasoned with themselves. It was time to go to God and go to the scriptures. Was John's ministry from heaven? Well, is it in the scripture? Was it prophesied? Do we have it? Yes, yes, yes. But instead of doing that, they just reasoned with themselves. And when you just reason with yourself and you formulate your own beliefs, yourself from yourself, the best you can do after careful examination is, I can't tell. And your words will be powerless. Now, uh, in verse, uh, what, 28 or so, I think it is. After they were let go, uh, they, they gathered together, they prayed, and in verse 29, they said, Lord, behold their threatenings, and notice what they prayed for, grant unto your servants that with what? With all boldness, they may speak your word. Would you, do you need to pray for boldness? That's not a hard question. Did they pray for boldness? Well, why is it recorded? Father, now, now th- this is an important question because there are people who think you can just be bold. That you can just work it up. And if you're feeling timid, are afraid, you just need to 
uh, you know, reach down and, and get something and be bold. But if that's the case, then you wouldn't need to pray to be bold. Hold your place here, or they'll put it back on the screen. Ephesians 6, 19 and 20. Ephesians 6, 19 and 20, Paul, by the Spirit, said this. He said, and for me, and what he's talking about is pray for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, he went on to say, for which I'm an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Is he requesting that the church of Ephesus pray for him that he would get, that he'd have boldness and speak boldly? The way some people think today, they would have wrote back to Paul and said, hey, just be bold, brother. We don't need to be praying for you to be bold. Well, it wasn't just Paul talking. It was the Spirit of God through Paul talking. So apparently he did need prayer to be bold. Why? Tell me what makes you bold. Come on, help me. We've already talked about it. What makes you bold? You're sure. You're sure. What makes you bold? You're sure. And, and the anointing reveals things to you and that's how you get sure. And the anointing moves on you and that gives you confidence. Yes. Being sure, being confident is what makes you bold. It's not something you work up. That's why they're praying for it. That's why they're asking for it. Back to Acts, if you would. Back to Acts, the fourth chapter. They said, Lord, Verse 29, behold their threatenings, grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child Jesus. That's why you're not going to see miracles. If you come to pray for sick people and say, Lord, if it be thy will, huh? Are you sure of anything? Nothing. Well, is it God's will for them to be healed or not? What's their conclusion? We cannot tell. Why? Because the basis and foundation of their faith is not the Word of God. It's religious tradition. It's their own opinion. It's their own interpretation of their past experiences and other people's experiences. And that will only leave you in confusion. And then people approach it like, I'm not worthy to pray for this person and I probably shouldn't even be asking you anything, but, but, but here goes, we, you know, we're doing the best we know how. No confidence, condemnation, confusion, that's exactly where the enemy wants all of us to be. So that we pray powerless, nothing prayers, we pray, we speak powerless confessions, nothing words. And without him, we are nothing. But we're not without him. Huh? Have I missed it and made mistakes? You know I have, but I'm either clean by the blood or I'm not. I'm either made righteous by what Jesus did or I'm not. Right? And he's either given us the authority of his name or he hasn't. No, child of God, do not let the enemy trick you and beguile you into entertaining all these phony, false humility stuff uh, uh, of questioning everything and, and acting like you're nothing and you have nothing and you can't do anything, that will just leave you without. Oh, but friend, hang out with Jesus. Amen. Not with religiously confused people. Jesus. <laughs> hang out with Jesus. Oh, somebody say hang out with Jesus. Yeah. They took notice of them that they had been with Jesus. And hanging with Jesus for those three years or so, they got rid of their goofy religious traditions. They got rid of all the stupid questions and junk that had paralyzed them for all their all life. And they began to see the truth that made them free. They began to see the reality of having authority over the enemy. And they saw what Jesus was saying. They saw what he was doing. And eventually they realized we can do it too. We can do that. In fact, 
He sent them. He authorized them and sent them to do it. Amen. And he has authorized us too. Amen. He has empowered us too. Amen. Not only were his words with authority and power, your words can carry weight. Somebody say, my words can carry weight. My words can be powerful. They will be powerful when you are convinced. When you are fully persuaded about what you're saying and what you're doing. If you're not, don't despair. Don't despair. All of us started out with different degrees of ignorance and goofy ideas. But if, if, you, if you keep hanging with Jesus and listening to him, right? Your mind gets renewed. You start thinking right. You start thinking more like him. And you get things settled. And everything you get settled and you walk in the light of it is an area the enemy can no longer steal from you. Amen. It's an area the enemy can no longer destroy in your life. Amen. Every area you get settled in and you get bold in. <laughs> I saw it in the spirit just then. I saw it. There are people the enemy has tormented for decades. Because of just what we're talking about. They just are so wish-washy and so wavery about it. But he's going to show up in the near future and he's going to go, uh-oh, uh-oh, they found out. Uh-oh, uh-oh, they found out. Because you're going to meet him at the door and go, uh-uh, no, no. This is not a negotiation. This is not a request. I command you. Oh, oh, and because you're doing it based on his words, Jesus' words, and what you got from him, he's going to be right there to say, yes, and the spirit of God's going to back it up. And that's why the devil flees. That's why he run, he flees because <laughs> he can't play you anymore in that area. You have found out. You have got the light. You have become persuaded. Stand on your feet, everybody. Hang out with Jesus. Amen. Y'all can stand up if you want to. Um, so the, the um, answer to being fully persuaded is what? Hanging out with Jesus. Hanging out with Jesus. How do we hang out with Jesus? That's right. We cannot say, uh, I just can't hear from God. I just can't hear from the Lord and not pick this book up. This, this is how he talks to us. Amen. And so there really is a time, and y'all know this. Uh, I would venture to say everyone in this room has experienced this, that that you've gone from not being fully persuaded to being fully persuaded. Is that right? Woo, that is an exciting time. Listen, what I want to encourage you with is don't be discouraged because in order to become fully persuaded, where when we open our mouth, it's with power, which is where we want to be. Is that right? When we open our mouth that it is with power. But the first step is that we become fully convinced and fully persuaded. And so part of that is the meditation of the word. The meditation of, of the word, the promise. And so I want to just, uh, I want to read this. This is uh, in Matthew. Sorry, hang on. Matthew uh, chapter 8 and verse 16 and 17. It says, When evening came, they brought to him many who were under the power of demons, and he drove out the spirits with a word. I would say his word was with power. Amen. And he restored to health all who were sick. Amen. All. All who came to him, he restored all. 
in verse 17 says, And thus he fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He himself took in order to carry away our weaknesses and infirmities, and he bore away our diseases. If we're ever going to be fully convinced and fully persuaded about any promise of God, what God says about us, then we're going to have to take his word and we're going to have to meditate on it because all of us have wrong thought patterns. We've had different experiences. We've had different teachings and we all need mind renewal, right? And so part of renewing my mind, I cannot even begin to tell you the number of hours that I have spent in this one verse. The number of hours that I have spent in this one verse. And so it's not just reading it, it's getting it on the inside of us. That it changes me from the inside out. It causes me to become fully persuaded that God's will for me is to be healed. Amen. And so part of meditation also, so this is what I'm saying. I I, I say this a lot. Uh, It is written, he himself took in order to carry away my weaknesses and my infirmities, and he bore away my diseases. And so I'm going to say it out loud, and I'm going to say it out loud, and I'm going to say it out loud. What am I doing? I'm meditating on it. I'm, I'm, I am decreeing it, I am declaring it, but I'm meditating on it. And I am letting it paint a picture. So when I, when I read these words, I am picturing Jesus at the cross. I'm picturing him at the whipping post. And I'm seeing him take my punishment. Amen. Amen. I'm seeing him hanging on the cross and every one of my weaknesses, every one of my infirmities, every one of my diseases being put upon him. And the scripture says, and he bore them away. Amen. And so we meditate and we say and we get that word within us and we become fully persuaded. And then there came a time to where I opened my mouth and you opened my mouth and I say, it is written. He himself took in order to carry away my weaknesses and my infirmities and he bore away my diseases. Body, in the name of Jesus, I call you whole. I call you healed. I call you strong from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. My liver is strong. My nerves are strong. Amen. For it is written. And so, so uh, that's what I'm saying. Don't wait to say something before you become fully convinced. Say something to become fully convinced. And then you'll know when it hits on the inside. That's right. I've got... That is right. It is written. And then we open our mouth with power. Amen. Glory to God. And that will work with, uh, with any of the promises. All of the promises just like that. Concerning our minds. Concerning our finances. Concerning our children. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And I just plead the blood of Jesus over every person, uh, over every family, over every heart right now, over this word that has come forth. And Father, I thank you that that this word, Lord, this word uh, will bring much fruit planted in our hearts. I apply the blood of Jesus that the enemy does not steal it from our hearts. That we will not be just forgetful hearers, but that we will be doers of the word. Glory to God. Father, I thank you. I just thank you. I thank you that uh, uh, that there's turning points. There's just turning points. There's turning points in people's lives in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. And we say thank you, Lord. We say thank you, Lord. According, according to your word, we, we, we put your good word in our mouth and in our hearts. We say what you say about us. We say what you say about us. Uh, Brad, if you want to put that first screen up there, we're, we're going to put his word in our mouth. And uh, this, is, this is a lot of ways that um, 
when we're talking about confessions, this is the way I renewed my mind was with the word. So a lot of my confessions are word for word because that's how I renewed my mind with it and the declaration of it in our lives. But it's good. Get these words in our mouth, in our mouth and in our hearts. Let's, uh, let's read them together, all right? We call our bodies healed, whole, and strong. They serve us well and in health and strength all the days of our lives. No plague, no pestilence, no evil, no destruction comes near our dwelling. With long life, God satisfies us and shows us his salvation. All grace abounds unto us, and we have all sufficiency in all things, and we abound unto every good work. Quit talking lack. Quit talking how much groceries are. Quit talking about the economy. This right here is what God says about us. This right here is what God says. Amen. And, and we don't just do this once. This is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. We, we walk and we live by faith. We don't visit it. Amen. All grace abounds unto us. We have all sufficiency in all things. Let that paint a picture in your mind and in your heart. I don't lack. I don't lack. My fa <coughs> Excuse me. My family doesn't lack. Amen. All right, the last one. We are living memorials in the earth to show that the Lord is upright and faithful to his promises. Amen. Yeah, you can go to the next one, uh, Brad. Sorry about that. <clears throat> There is no depression or hopelessness in our household because we know and are convinced we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. How can we be convinced that we're going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? Because His Word tells us that right there, Psalms 27, 13. Amen. I call our house and this house blessed in Jesus' name. Our eyes are bright. Our hearts are filled with truth. Our lips speak words of life and truth. We will be a blessing to many in 2024 will be the best year of our lives. Don't let that be a catchphrase. Become fully convinced and you will see it in your life. Because God watches over his word to perform it. Amen. Amen. We love you guys and we'll see you on Sunday.